All right, folks. Good afternoon or good evening um, if you're um, on the other side of the pond. Um, so that's good to be on live. Um, had a good couple of weeks. Uh, semester is finally wrapping up for me, which means uh, my life can be a little bit less crazy. Um, I'm teaching four classes this semester and doing uh, esoterica. And so it's a pretty heavy lift. And so actually having the uh, these four classes come to an end this week, my last one ended this morning, uh, really means that I have a lot more time to do other things. Uh, like what I've been doing today and yesterday was uh, studying uh, the Zohar. Um, yeah, I've been studying the Zohar today. It's Lag Omer, And so I decided to jump in and... Uh, and start studying or restudy uh, some sections of the Zohar, specifically uh, Idra, uh, Idra Zuta, the, the small assembly where uh, Shimon Bar Yochai dies, um, which is a, yeah, both of the uh, Idra are incredibly weird um, parts of the Zohar. So uh, very challenging, uh, especially trying to read them in the original Aramaic. Um, but, um, and of course, this terrible tragedy that went down uh, yesterday in Meron. Um, I hope those folks are comforted in their loss, uh, which uh, which is a terrible, terrible situation. I think 45 people crushed to death in Meron uh, on, um, uh, on 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 Lagba Omer. Um, so this is uh, this is dreadfully, dreadfully, dreadful, dreadful. So um, uh, may the memory be for a blessing and. Um, yeah, I hope folks are having a, a good evening and a good Lagba Omer if you celebrate Lagba Omer. Um, this edition of the Zohar is, um, uh, this is printed in, I don't even know where it's printed. Probably in the first edition, probably in the first thing. This is a super cheap little, like you can buy this version of the Zohar for uh, like a hundred bucks. You can get the entire thing for a hundred bucks. And the reason why I like this one is because uh, unlike the standard academic version, which is right there, uh, the three volumes, uh, three volume Margoliot version of the Zohar, which is the standard one if you really want to do academic stuff, um, and if you're really hardcore. Uh, but this one is nice because it's uh, Manukad. It actually has the the vowels in it, and so uh, reading it uh, Manukad is um, is uh, is a lot is a lot easier is a lot easier. So uh, especially for me, I my my, my Hebrew and Aramaic are not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, and so. Um, and so it, it helps me to limp along in the Aramaic, which is already a challenge enough because it's so weird. Um, it's so weird. Um, yeah, the Daniel Mount, of course. Yeah, you can always, I have it over there. I was looking at it earlier. Uh, I'm definitely not competent enough that I can uh, I can read, just go straight to the Aramaic. I usually have to have both sitting in front of me and uh, especially with the Sohar. So uh, the Danny Matt is, uh, it's great. It's great. Um, hey, Dan Attrell, Modern Hermeticist. Um, I was on. I was actually briefly on the other uh, the other day the, uh, the live stream with uh, I think her name is Default Friend and Bimbo Ubermensch, uh, who I just really like both of those a lot. Uh, they're just really super smart people. I think if I think that uh, between you and them, that might be able to convince me to get onto Twitter. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know. Um, let me scroll back up. Uh, and look at some of the questions that got asked. Oh, uh, before I got on the stream and see if I can answer some of these. Uh, oh wow, Max Musterman, you really go deep. Uh, the Bakor Mavis uh, in Job 18. Um, who knows what anything in Job's about? Job's a super weird book. Uh, I tell people that my my I tell when I teach Bible, my I tell my students that if you want to go to a, a translation of the Bible and see if it's worth its salt, look at the bottom of any page of, Zo of Job, and if it doesn't say meaning of Hebrew uncertain, then you have basically a lying edition of the Bible. Uh, Job is an incredibly difficult text to tease out, both from a linguistic and from a mythological point of view. But there is this weird reference in uh, in Job 18 about the Bakor Mavet, uh, the firstborn of death, is literally what this means. And this firstborn of death gets mentioned, I think it's a Hapax Legemenon, I think it's only mentioned that one time in Job, it never gets mentioned again. And there's a lot of like commentaries and stuff about whatever, what is this supposed to mean? What is the firstborn of death? Is this some kind of angel or demon or, or something. Um, and the general consensus of what I've read from scholars is that typically death in the ancient Near East was thought of as like a being. Uh, it was, in, you know, and of course in the Baal cycle, it, it is, it's a god, right? Death is a god uh, and Baal has to contend and fight with God. Well, there's a sense in the ancient Near East that God gives birth, that the, 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 the god Mavet uh, Mot gives birth to these uh, offspring. 
And the first offspring of, of death is, uh, is disease, right? Disease is the first offspring of death, which if you, uh, oh, thank you, David, so much. It's good to see you. I hope you're doing well, brother. Um, thank you so much. Um, uh, so yeah, so you get this uh, business of the the Bokorum, Bokorum Avis, sorry, Bokorum Avis, I slipped into my Ashkenazi pronunciation, um, but it's probably disease. And if you read the entire Peric, that entire section, um, it's probably, there's so much talk about disease and leprosy and stuff that the reference there is probably to the firstborn child of, of death is probably um, disease, which is interesting, by the way, because in some sections of the Hebrew Bible, both plague and uh, plague and uh, fever, dever, uh, are um, uh, sort of like the the chariot that drives God and God's wrath, and so plague becomes sort of the children of God as uh, of, of Yahweh. So you get that kind of stuff as well. So super weird stuff with the Bekormavis, uh, Bekormavet, uh, in um, in that text. In that text. So um, some more stuff on Pazuzu. Um, I think most of what we know about Pazuzu is mostly from the amulets, right? We have a lot of amulets um, with Pazuzu on them. And so we know, right, that he's the demon of one of the winds. Um, probably the, I think the east wind, I think, is the east wind is the one that's hot and dry. And so he's the wind. He's the demon of that wind. Uh, he dwells in Kur in the underworld. And he comes out and does all kinds of bad stuff. His sister, of course, is Lamashtu. Lamashtu is the predecessor for Lilith. Uh, Lamashtu is a demoness responsible for killing, uh, killing babies, uh, crib death, um, and um, and so this this is great sort of using demons against demons business that you see in the ancient near ancient near eastern world where you would use one demon to fight against another demon. Which that idea must have been current even by the time of Jesus, because Jesus of course was accused of doing the same thing. He's accused of uh, driving out one demon with the power of another demon, which apparently was a, still a common theme in the kind of magic that existed at that time. Uh, but we see that uh, Lamashtu is terrified of Pazuzu and using uh, Pazuzu amulets, which I have a little Pazuzu amulet that I wear as a fob on my watch. Um, and uh, you would use the Pazuzu amulet to scare away the Lamashtu amulet. There's a great one in the Louvre. The, probably the most famous one is in the Louvre. Um, and if you look at, you always see the front of it, right? Because he's like holding up with his hands and he has the, you know, scary. Although in that one, he doesn't have the snake penis, which in a lot of one, he does have snake penis, which is terrifying in its own way. Um, but the back of it has an inscription, right? I mean, no one ever takes a picture of the back of it, but it says like, I am, my name is Pazuzu and I do the X, Y, and Z. And so it's a neat little amulet um, uh, made in metal to, to drive off, um, to drive off the, um, um, Lamashtu and other demons. Um, oh man, I'm scared to even read Modern Hermeticist question. Some of the subtle differences between the Sephirot and the Sephirot Yetzera, um, and the Sephirot and the Zohar. Yeah, I, I think that the 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 main thing that in uh, Dan, I think in the in Sefer Yetzera, there's no sense that they're actually emanations of God. That just it just doesn't. It, it's. I think, and th again, this is controversial because of everything about the damn Sefer Yetzirah is controversial. I think that the Sefer Yetzirah is much more of like a Pythagorean text, that it thinks of number, right? Like numericality, the numbers one through 10 is sort of the, the a, kind of a base 10. And then you add to that, so that gives you number, right? And then you add to that the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and you get the sort of 32 paths of wisdom or whatever. And I think that in that text, in Sefer Yetzirah, it's just mathematical, ontological principles. I don't think that they're emanations of God at all. There's no reason to believe that. And in fact, the earliest commentaries never even insinuate that. So if you look at um, the Saudi Gaon, uh, all the early, early commentaries uh, from around the 10th century, none of them think of the Seferot in, the, in, the, in that text as emanations of God. It's only later in the Sefer Bahir uh, where that gets, where they get, the where the emanations are very clearly linked to properties of God, and those properties of God get get hypostasized. Um, and so it's only really in Sefer Bahir where that process really happens for the first time. And even by Sefer Zohar, and again, this is also be controversial, even in Sefer Zohar, the Zohar can't make its mind up about exactly these emanations. Even earlier on in like the Iyun circle, which was just before the Sefer Zohar, even the number of Sephirot isn't hammered down yet, right? There's, I think that there are 13 Sephirot in the Bahir tradition. So even the exact number of these things isn't hammered out completely until 
until really um, Zohar, and even in Zohar, they're really, really weird. Uh, and it's really not until people like Joseph Ikatia and stuff that, that you really get the hammered out version of the of the Sephirot as we as we as they get inherited into Kabbalah as we know it. Uh, and so often, even in Sefer Zohar, um, it's even difficult to know exactly what the configurations are and how they work. And then, of course, you have to add to that the later systems in the Zohar of the Partsufim, these uh, different configurations of the of the of the Sephirot, uh, depending on what's going on inside the divine realm in relationship to what's going on down here. And so, people often think of the Tree of Life as sort of this: there's Keter and then Bina, Chokmah, right, and it's kind of goes down to Malchut. But in the Zohar, these things can move around, right? The, the, the Sephirot are actually mobile. And depending on what's going on in the, the celestial world uh, or the metaphysical world of, of Jewish people doing uh, religious stuff and the, the divine world, the configuration of the divine world, the Sephirot are moving and relating to each other in all kinds of complicated ways. And so I think by the time, by the writing of the Zohar, it, it's thinking of them as stable configurations or hypotheses of God, a la uh, sort of like you know, you know, Platonic, right? Or with his three, or you know, the Orphic system, or whatever, uh, where you get these distinct emanations flowing down from God that flow from logical necessity one from the other. I don't think that's completely present, really, in the Sefer Zohar, and I think that's why, in my opinion, uh, the Sefer Zohar is not as Neoplatonic as people often make it out to be. I don't think it's it's Neoplatonic in just that way. Uh, that's my two cents. That's my two cents. Um, um, all right, so let's jump around to see some other questions. Um, yeah, talk enough about Bataille. So what's my opinion of Bataille? Oh man, I have Bataille's works over there. I'm looking at them. Um, I'm really seduced by Bataille. I find Bataille's, and I say seduced, I say seduced rather than convinced, um, because I, I don't, I'm not convinced he's right, but there's something very seductive in his base materialism, and especially his theory of of, of, of the accursed share, which, um, you know, sometimes philosophers like to take one big idea, right, and apply it to everybody, whether it fits or not, or whether there's anthropological data for it or not. Um, and I find the, the idea of the accursed share, this sort of excess that gets produced that must be destroyed, and that destruction, that ritual destruction as the act of making something sacred. Bataille says that the sacred is not something that, this is very different than Mary Douglas, right? The sacred is all about separating something off from us in the sort of Levitical sense. For, for, for Bataille, the sacred is something we create through through destroying this, uh, this excess share. And I find that idea really, really compelling. In fact, I wrote a paper about this where I tried to do a Bataille, Bataillean reading of Leviticus, because so much of Leviticus is dominated by the Mary Douglas read, which even she's heavily revised her theories later in life, but this sort of purity and danger stuff. And I find that while, yes, that's obvious, obviously there, there's also a Bataillean reading of understanding sacrifice, right, as both something that's destroyed, but also something that's brought near, right? The word for sacrifice in Hebrew, korban, uh, it, it, it means to get close to something. Uh, to draw near, um, and so the uh, so the 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 korbanot, right? They're on the one hand, they're separate from common people because only the kohanim, the priest, can perform them, but they're designed to draw near, which is again this really cool tension um, between the between the idea of korban as uh, as sending something up to God, uh, but at the same time it draws something near, and I think that there's something about that whole that word dialectic, whatever. That I think is really fascinating about Bataille. I also say just that Bataille was a big part of my intellectual development. I think it's maybe um, for many, that's not true, for some people, uh, but I also find his ideas to be incredibly dangerous, um, incredibly dangerous. Um, so uh, I, I would worry about um, especially young dudes reading, reading much Bataille. Um, but again, a super important thinker, and I find him really, really, really important, really important. Um, all right, so let me go back up here. I'm sorry if I'm I'm gonna I'm trying to. Um, is there any way why I say Sigil as opposed to Sigil? No, I just I don't. I think I'm sure I say it wrong. I, I don't know. I just I say Sigil sometimes. I don't like Sigil. I don't. I don't like the 
the uh, I don't know, maybe it's from Planescape from Dungeons and Dragons where I grew up playing it, and they really are picky about it being Seigel and not Sigil. I don't know. I could be completely wrong. Um, yeah, thanks, folks. Uh, thanks for um, the, the Logba Omer wishes. I'm all about Logba Omer. Like I said, I've been studying the waking up at five in the morning before my kids get up to study the Zohar the past couple of days, which has been great. Um, at what point did Gilgul reincarnation enter into Jewish thought? In the 16th century, right? This idea primarily comes from Itzhak Luria, and it's really developed primarily um, by uh, Chaim Vital and in his Sha'ar HaGilgulim, the Gates of Reincarnation. It's where this idea gets worked out at length. And there's some good, there's a good, I think there's a good English translation of at least parts of it, the Sha'ar HaGilgulim. I think it's expensive, but that's where the idea gets worked out. And it's not universally accepted. Uh, Gilgul is not a universally accepted vision of the afterlife, but it's normative. You can believe in it and not get kicked out of an Orthodox Jewish community. So, um, so you can totally, totally believe in reincarnation if you want. Um, um, does the Zohar talk about past life and ancestral things? I don't think it talks about past lives. I don't think so. But I mean, Zohar is a big text. I could totally be wrong. I don't, I'm not not some complete expert on, on Zohar. The Southwest wind, okay, not the East wind. That makes sense. Um, yep. Um, yeah, Sha'ar HaGogolim is a difficult text. Because um, the big thing about finding your soul root and every, every and you have to like, you have to do tikkunim, you have to do reparations uh, because you're the, because the soul, the, the, it's like karma. All of the evil stuff that you've done in your past lives, you're responsible for now. And you have to do tikkunim to like fix it, and uh, and some past lives are really bad. Like Chaim Vital's past life, he was his soul root goes back to Cain, and so obviously you know Cain's bad guy, and um, and so um, so yeah, so um, so you have to fix that stuff. And part of what you can get done, I've heard, I've never done this myself, but apparently there are people in the Kabbalistic world that will tell you who your soul root is and all the various things, all the tikkunim you need to do to fix your soul root so you can do whatever. But this is an idea that's still current. I think there are people in Sfat that um, that um, in Israel that that do this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, 13, 13 emanations in the Iyun circle, which thirteen makes sense more than ten does, because typically God is thought of in Talmudic literature as having thirteen attributes. So it makes much more sense if God had thirteen at if there were thirteen emanations, because there are thirteen traditional attributes. But it's not the way that it works. It's not the way that it works. Um, so yeah, it's kind of funny. The 13 thing is weird for people, but but the EUN circle was never very big. And it was only recently, it's only in the past 60, 50 years that we've really got access to those texts. And they weren't terribly influential. They were too esoteric for their own good. Um, don't be too esoteric. You can esoteric yourself out of a job. Uh, you can esoteric yourself out of history if you're really uh, if you're really too good at it. Um, do I have any amulets to fight COVID? No, I've heard that there's a vaccine though. Um, I've, I've gotten both shots and it seems, uh, I, I've heard good things. Um, so let's see. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Murdoch. Welcome. I'm glad I'm all about folks being on the site. Thank you so much for, um, thank you for hanging out. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Mike, for your donation to the, to the, to the project. Um, Oh, an esoterica uh, review of Dune. You know, I'm, I, you know, I, I, I read Dune last summer for the first time. Um, I think I've talked about this before. I have a really difficult time uh, reading fiction, so I really have to make, discipline myself to do it. And I read Dune last year, and I'm going to read Dune Messiah this year. And eventually, by the time I'm dead, I'll have gotten through half of the Dune books. But yeah, maybe I can do something on, on, on sort of some of the more esoteric stuff. That'd be a cool project to do with uh, Philip over at uh, Let's Talk Religion. He's, he's a great expert in, in Islamic stuff. And so obviously there's so much Islamic mysticism with the Mahdi and uh, all that stuff wrapped up in the Dune mythology that we need to, um, to, to work with him on. Um, all right. You know, David Alonzo, thank you also for your donation. Have I looked into the Fulcanelli and the Mystery of the Cathedrals? You know, I have not. Um, it, it's, he's like on my list. Fulcanelli's on my list. Manly P. Hall's on my list. There's like, there, you know, Gertajev, there are these people that have written these huge, hugely important things. You know, I flipped through the Fulcanelli stuff before, and 
what well, I remember when I flipped through it, I looked through it very briefly once, and I and what it struck me was that um, it, it's it was clear to me that he had done some he had done some laboratory alchemy, right? That this is a text born out of some experience of doing laboratory alchemy, because you can at least when you read enough alchemical literature, you can begin to see the people that are like BSing it because they just make up stuff. Or they just say all kinds of random stuff like, you know, the white dove will marry the peacock and then the dead man will rise from this and blah, blah, blah. And they say all this nonsense stuff that has nothing to do with alchemy. It's just weird symbolism they put together. But the, when you read alchemists, they're describing chemical processes. They're describing what they're seeing in a, in a, in a, in a coded language, just like modern chemists do. Um, or the deck nine one or whatever. And when I remember looking at Fulcan, I was like, he's done this. And then I, my mind goes to spinning, like, where did he learn to do this? Or like, you know, how did this all work? Um, and things like this. But uh, I haven't read him in, in any close detail. So I'd like to uh, like to do that. Um, I actually bought some Cinnabar the other day, actually, uh, because I'm thinking about maybe, maybe, maybe uh, trying to do a reproduction of an alchemical experiment. Um, where I extract and purify some mercury from cinnabar because that, that would have been the first stage in the historical alchemical process. And so I'm kind of curious about um, trying to do it safely. I'm going to talk to some chemist friends of mine is about, is there a way to do it safely? Um, is there a way of doing it safely that I could actually do it on my own, maybe with a chemist helping me and actually do the entire process of uh, extracting cinnabar, mercury from cinnabar, just like the old alchemist would have done it. So um, I might, now, again, I want to get some expert opinions about it, but uh, I know how to do it. At least I know how to do it chemically, and I know how they did it, how the alchemists did it. There are a couple different ways to do it, and so I might um, I might do that as like a summer project, like to extract some mercury from um, some extract some mercury from uh, from raw cinnabar, just like just like uh, the alchemists would have done. So I like the idea of recreating this stuff. I'm I'm really a sucker for that kind of forensic alchemy. Um, you know, like Princep and, and those guys are just, I love that stuff. It just makes me feel, I just love that stuff. Um, let me jump up and see some of the questions as they're coming out, folks. You guys ask so many, um, let's see. My papers on Bataille. Uh, I don't even know where it is anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm I don't know about y'all, but I, I feel terrified to look at old papers that I wrote because that's so like often I think they're so bad. Uh, maybe I'll try to dig it up and find it. But um, um, recommend an orphism. I don't know uh, if modern medicine is still here. Uh, he might know a good text on orphism. I I mean the book uh, Dylan's book on the middle Platonist I think has a section on orphism, but um, uh, instead of the Platonic underworld, which is a great term. Um, so, um, so that might be worth looking up. It, it's in there, but uh, the, if the modern medicine is still here, then trail, he would also, he has a background on that kind of stuff. Yeah. I agree with you, Daniel, that, uh, log bomber ended really terribly. Yeah. I, the, the situation in, in Maron is awful. I've been there and I've been through those staircases and I've seen images of all those Haredi folks. Um, and you know, I've been to log bomber celebrations, right. And I've been to, I've been to them and I've been, definitely had too much to drink at them. And I've definitely been, um, uh, you know, crowded up with a bunch of people and God, that's just awful. Just awful. Um, I really feel awful for those folks. Feel awful. Um, all right. Let's see, Yuri, last time you experienced weird and unexplained things, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's stuff from like when I was a kid, you know, like I remember, and again, this sounds so silly, but I remember my brother, we were out in the Delta. My my mother's family comes from the Mississippi Delta, which is kind of a haunted place in general. But uh, we were down playing by a, a river, or a stream rather, and I distinctly remember looking over over my brother's shoulder and there being a like a girl wearing a old-fashioned dress, like a you know, kind of white dress. And I remember like waving at her and her not waving back. And um and thinking like, oh, she's stuck up or something. Like she's some fancy rich person or something. And we got back to the old house where my great aunts lived, I guess. And I told my mom this. And I was like, yeah, we saw this girl down by the bank. And she's like, there's no one living here. And there's no one five miles from here. And I, and I still wonder what I saw, right? Because it's very vivid in my mind. And like, you know, is that ghosts? I don't know. I don't know. So that kind of stuff, like that kind of stuff, uh, 
weird supernatural stuff. But aside from that, I've not experienced much in the way of supernatural stuff. I'd love to. I've gone on lots of uh, uh, these like paranormal investigations and things. Uh, there's a pretty famous one here in Michigan called uh, a haunted place called, it's an old asylum. We used to do hydrotherapy and stuff on people. God. Um, I can't remember. Uh, the Eloise. The Eloise. Um, they had a really cool fundraiser for uh, uh, for the public radio. And the, the fundraiser was uh, a paranormal investigation. And I was brought on as sort of a, you know, esoteric -y trained person or whatever, skeptical person or whatever. And um, they had, you know, all this stuff trying to find evidence of ghosts at this uh, place of El Eloise. But I've not ever seen a ghost or experienced anything supernatural, I don't think. But I would certainly like to. I'd love to be surprised. Have I read the Kabbalion? Yes, I've read the Kabbalion. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make an episode about it uh, because it's so controversial. It makes it has it inspires such strong feelings that eventually I will make a a real make I will make a uh, an episode about it because whether it's hermetic or not doesn't really matter. What really matters is it's hugely important in the in the New Age movement. So uh, um, so I need to yeah do a video about it. Uh, are are you a Kabbalist? I am not a Kabbalist, but that's exactly the kind of thing a Kabbalist would say. Um, um, but yeah, I'm not. I don't think I'm a Kabbalist. I mean, I read a lot. I read enough Kabbalah to be one. If I ever decide to be one, it would be, it would be easy to 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 switch over. Um, let's see. Let me jump back up and see. Right. Yeah, though, and again, the, the saying, uh, what you're saying, Dan, about the, or, the orphism is that it seems like one of these things kind of like, I mean, it's worse than Pythagoreanism. It's kind of just whatever people say it is at the time, and it gets used in all kinds of uh, contexts that don't really make any sense. And it's one of these words that gets thrown around, like Sethian, like, you know, some of these Gnostic terms get thrown around. And, um, you know, what exactly they're supposed to mean is really, really unclear. Um Yes, if I attempt to do some forensic alchemy, if I attempt to do, uh, you best believe if I'm going to do any kind of alchemical experimentation whatsoever, you definitely, you definitely believe I will be recording it and making an episode about it. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, if anything, like I said, if, any, if I do anything, it's going to be super, it's going to be in, in, in incredibly safe conditions because, uh, you know, dealing with things like um, mercury, I mean, just mercury vapor is incredibly toxic. Uh, and I just don't want to have anything to do with anything dangerous. I don't recommend any doing anything, anything dangerous. Ugh. Uh, good alchemy book. Annie Kurtz, um, uh, on, on pretty much all the episodes that I do on alchemy, uh, if you just want to look at one of those, I include a list of, uh, of resources. The only book that's not going to be on those lists, uh, the resources for good books on alchemy is, uh, Jennifer Rampling's new book, The Experimental Fire, which is a really great book on the history of English alchemy. And so it's not on there just because I haven't added it yet. But uh, any of my alchemy videos has uh, has, a, has a reading list for folks who want to do that reading. Um, Digital Villain, thank you for your for donation to the channel. Um, have I ever heard of Diana Walsh? Pasulka? No, I haven't. I've not heard of this person. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't, I've not heard of them. What? Why? Why would? What? What? Uh, what's the story with them? If you don't mind telling me, I'm sorry that you. Ask me a question, and now I, I don't know the I don't know the answer to it. All right, let's see. Let's see. Go back up here. Sorry, folks. I'm just trying to look at. Is it safe to practice Kabbalistic magic in a scholarly setting and not ever experience severe consequences? I don't know. I can't. I mean, I will say that, I mean, I don't know, Kabbalistic magic, what are, I'm not sure quite what you mean there. Um, but there's a really great book out by uh, Joseph, uh, not Joseph, Don, by Moshe Adele, where they tested some Kabbalistic meditation techniques uh, neurologically. And it showed to, it seemed to show um, effectivity, whatever you want to define as effective. But that's a new book out, relatively new, newer book out by uh, Moshe Adele, who seems to put out new books every three days or something. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, but um, there's a book there about Jewish meditation and using some of the Kabbalistic meditation techniques of um, of Abalathia, and they seem to have an effect. So I, I guess that's safe. I don't know. Um, 
Um, I think consistently describe me on own beliefs in semi Kabbalistic terms. Not really. I mean, I, I don't think of myself as a Kabbalist. Um, I mean, I, I typically think of myself, you know, like, again, as a kind of materialist. Um, it, basically, a dialectical materialist, if you want to get fancy about it. Um, and, but I think that, again, I, I think that one, that, that, that Kabbalah has a weird kind of relationship to theism, where Kabbalah, that at some levels of uh, Kabbalah is, 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 um, you know, Ain Sof, or, right, Ain Sof is, you know, the, that God is no thingness. And so, insofar as God is no thingness, um, believing in God is, is tantamount to idolatry. There's a way of doing Kabbalah like that. There's a way of understanding Kabbalah like that. And there have been people who, you know, rabbis, who've actually argued that, um, that, that atheism is compatible at some level with Kabbalah, which I find to be a really interesting kind of logical move. But, um, but no, do I, do, I, do I think that there are sephirot? I, I don't know. Probably not. Maybe. Maybe. Are there any angel evocation practices in Kabbalah? Yes. Yes, there are. Lots. Uh, there are lots. I mean, the, uh, there are lots of texts that engage in uh, angelic invocation. Uh, uh, what's a good example? The Sartora mysticism, which is technically pre-Kabbalah, but gets absorbed into Kabbalah. And that basically is you invoking an angel to teach you stuff, uh, to learn rabbinic wisdom. So yeah, there's a long history of invoking angels to do all kinds of things. Um, um, so yeah, angelic evocation is, is part of, is, there is a history of that in Kabbalah. And that is a thing. All right. Let's see. What books would I recommend to start studying or start start practicing magic in a scholarly setting? What do you mean? I guess, uh, Gaino Trade, what do you mean uh, practicing magic in a scholarly setting? Because tech, 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 I mean, in a specific way, academics, we, at least for academics, we separate our religious beliefs from our scholarly beliefs at some level, or maybe we combine them at some level, but typically um, there's no academic doing of magic. I don't think uh, that that would be one's own spiritual path or what have you. Um, but I think the idea is that I have lots of recommendations for books on magic from a scholarly pr perspective, uh, from the practitioner's perspective. I mean, it's hard for me to give advice about that considering that I, I don't practice magic myself. I, I feel like it wouldn't be right for me to give, um, for me to give advice at, at that level. Let's see. Professor Murdoch, this may seem to odd, but are you, are you atheistic? Yes, I, I don't, I, I, I'm, I do not hold beliefs that there is a, 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 an ontological being that, that is God. Yeah, don't I don't buy that. I, I don't I don't. Or I guess another way of saying it, I don't see I don't see compelling evidence, philosophically or or empirically for such a being, for such a being. So yeah, not that convinced. Uh, but I'm also just not that interested in the question. Like I mean, I, I'm interested in the sense that I'm interested in, in an academic way and I'm interested in a philosophical way. But uh, I don't know. There's this this there's a weird there's a I find that there's this very strange. And I think it comes from Protestantism. This really intense focus about what you believe and there's a super intense idea about believing in things and you have to believe in things and there's this really i think it really comes from basically christianity and especially protestantism and i often just find that beliefs are of so little consequence to things um i, I find that beliefs are actually very i find i'm very skeptical of my own beliefs and i find that people who really ardently believe in things there's no correlation that i've experienced between people believing in things them having any good reason to believe in anything. Um, and so often I just find belief to be a very, uh, uh, I, mean, I find belief to be a spurious concept just in general. Um, and then on top of that, uh, even concepts of consciousness and stuff like that, I'm very skeptical of. Um, uh, it may surprise people that I'm really a big fan of the Churchland camp, uh, the, the so-called eliminative materialists when it comes to consciousness. Uh, I don't think, I'm very skeptical there is a such thing as consciousness. Uh, I think it may be a folk belief that ultimately neuroscience will will get rid of. So I'm not. I, yeah. So I, I I find that yeah I'm even skeptical that there isn't such thing as consciousness. Um. So, um. 
Yeah. So yeah. So I yeah, I'm very I'm a big fan of like the church lens, uh, Paul and Patricia. I think that they're I think they're onto something. And I think the fact that people are so polarized by them tells me that they're really onto something in a deep way. Um so let me scroll back up, folks. You guys ask such like probing, interesting questions. Um Other chart recommendations for stuff about Bataille. You know, there's, I think that there is, there has to be a book over there on my shelf about Bataille and, and esotericism. Um, but I think it's basically what he would have had, what he would have had available to him at the time, uh, which is not that much. But I think that there are definitely all kinds of very like esoteric -y readings of Bataille um, that jive with some Crowley stuff and things like that. I can't think of, nothing's jumping out to my mind. I don't feel like, I don't want to get up and go look over there. But they're definitely, uh, uh, definitely, definitely an intersection between, especially left-hand path people, uh, and 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 Bataille people. So, all right. Have I heard of any recent successes of angel invoking? I think it'd be true. I, I this uh, didn't. Isn't there a Swedish guy, Scandinavian guy, who what, did Enochian magic and got new Enochian words and new Enochian? Phrases and things like this. Um, um, do, do I think they're? Do I do I believe that they're contacting angels? I I don't know. I don't think so. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that angels exist in that way. But um, but I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I do find it interesting they got new Enochian stuff though. That's neat. That's that's a that's a huge claim. Um, and it would be it would be great to um, to to you know, to unpack some of that stuff more, but I haven't looked at that stuff in a long time. I've been refreshing my John D stuff uh, to do some episodes this summer about D. Um, so I'm really interested in, you know, looking at, uh, looking at John D more closely. Um, can I elaborate on um, no such thing as consciousness? Yeah, I think that consciousness may be one of these words like soul or anima or suke. It's one of these words that, that gets bandied around. And because basically we don't have a complete neurology, a complete understanding of the of the of the neuroscientific structure of the brain um, that we just use terms that basically are stand-ins for something we don't fundamentally understand yet, and so I think that all of these folk psychological terms for what is going on, what what's happening inside the structure of the brain, um, we just don't have any good. We have no good, very very little good philosophy uh, on it, and so uh, I think that it's just a. I think it's basically a placeholder word for a concept that we that doesn't probably exist. Um, so yeah, if you again, this, I know this argument sounds completely crazy and self-defeating, right? It's sort of like this is the argument made by Descartes, right? You know that you exist because you think, and you know, doubting is a form of thinking. And if you're doubting, you're thinking, you know, you exist. And this, I know this, uh, this idea has been, uh, you know, this is, goes all the way back to the Enlightenment. But I'm not even that sure of this sort of Enlightenment, right? Notion, right? Uh, so I'm, 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 um, I'm just, I'm just not. I'm just skeptical of that. That this thing called a consciousness that we've put all this emphasis on, I'm just not sure it's there. I think there, I think it's, it could be a ghost in the machine. Any more than a thermometer is, or any more than a thermostat's conscious when it knows and it knows that the temperature in the room has gone down enough to click on and turn on the the, the boiler in my basement. I don't think that I don't ascribe consciousness to that to that thermostat um, any more than I might ascribe it to us. We just might be a really complicated thermostat. So, um, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced. I know this is the thing that makes people crazy, but I, yeah, it's just like one of those things where like, um, yeah, I'm not super convinced that consciousness is real. Now, again, if you go check the arguments out, check out the Churchlands. Their big major book is called Neurophilosophy. Uh, and it is a, uh, it's, it's, it's a hell of a read. I really would recommend it. I think it's really great. Um, nice beard. Thank you, Regina. Um, I just I went to the gym today, so I actually had to shower afterwards and got to condition it and stuff. So it's funny to get compliments on a beard, considering I basically do nothing uh, and it just happens. Uh, basically, do nothing and, and and it just happens. Have I? Yeah, Jenny, this is a great question, right? Uh, and Jenny, thank you so much for supporting Esoterica on Patreon. Uh, I really support, really appreciate your support, and also really appreciate your super thoughtful comments. It's just always great. Um, do I think any experience of supernatural would change my mind? Absolutely. Yeah. If I, if I, again, it, it, it's, uh, if I had an experience of something and I, and I, and I set up conditions, I set up a, 
uh, I set up conditions that would that would um, that were falsifiable and that I could check for, I could correct for them. I could correct for all kinds of uh, I could control for all kinds of things. I would absolutely change my position. I would absolutely change my position. Um, and so, yeah, I can easily imagine setting up experiments that would that, you know, whether it be a scryer or I don't know, whatever. Uh, so I can easily imagine me being, I mean, also I can easily imagine me being wrong. Like I, I'm, I, I do take very seriously the fact that the vast majority of human beings throughout history, very, very, very smart people have not held this position, right? The, the position I hold, and uh, at least among all the people that I read and all the people that I study, I am the tiny, tiny, tiny minority about where I stand. And so the idea that all those people could be wrong, I could be right, that seems really unlikely. But I got to go with what I believe. I got to go with what, I, what what seems to make sense to me. And that's the position I've landed on. But the likelihood of me being wrong seems very possible, perhaps probable. And I can easily imagine, you know, that me being wrong. And I've sought out experiences, right, where I've tried to have talked to people who do uh, various kinds of uh, magical practices, you know, paranormal investigators. Uh, I'm, I'm super interested in that stuff. And I'm glad to go head first, headlong into those kinds of experiences because uh, I find that stuff to be so fascinating. And being wrong would just be a delight. I mean, I, I love to be wrong about my fundamental beliefs. It gives me something to do. Um, people who think that they figured everything out, God, they must be bored. Uh, must be the, the dogmatic people who have everything figured out. That must be the most boring intellectual world imaginable. Um, I love the idea of being fundamentally wrong. It gives me something to do for the next 20 years of my life and construct an entirely new metaphysics. It sounds like a, a lot of fun. Um, so I would, I would be all about, all about that, all about that. Um, so yeah, I can easily imagine being wrong. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. There's so many great questions. Um, have I ever read Schelling or Hegel? Oh, yeah. I've read a lot of both of those guys. I have a whole shelf of Hegel over there sagging under the weight of his of the of the dialectic. Uh, but yeah, I have I have a lot of um, uh, a lot of a lot of I love. Yeah, I really love Hegel. Uh, he's one of my favorite philosophers. Although my friend John, uh, who I uh, says he I, I call it sometimes the, the jester theorem. Um, that's his name. And he says that it's impossible to talk about Hegel in public without sounding like a jackass. And that's true absolutely true you cannot talk about hegel in public without sounding like a jackass this is this is verifiably verifiably true um let's see here did john d really use the 007 as a code name yeah he did yeah yeah oh yeah he definitely was 007 absolutely that's really true um that's really really true um so um what are my thoughts on planetary magic? Uh, it's neat. I mean, so much cool stuff, planetary magic. That's one of the really cool things about uh, Brian Johnson's book that we uh, talked about this week for the episode and, you know, had a really great conversation with Brian. And one of the things he decided to do in his uh, edition was to uh, include some of the really cool planetary aspects of, uh, of, uh, of this magical stuff, this sort of ma the, ma the, the magic of the necromancy and the Medici manual that we don't see in the Goetia and we don't see in, um, we don't see so much so in the uh, CLM 849, the Munich Necromancer's Manual. And so it's really great that he translated some of this stuff about the specific uh, planetary cycles by which, un under which one can do these kinds of, uh, uh, these kinds of magical procedures. So, uh, so yeah, I think the planetary magic stuff is neat. And again, it's like this, the vision of the world offered by uh, hermeticism, and I'll use that word in a very broad way here, where everything is fundamentally connected in some kind of way, that really strikes me as, as, um, as a neat, uh, and, and probably true. I mean, how could, what, what would it, what would it even mean for things to be somehow fundamentally, uh, fundamentally disconnected? I don't even know what that would even mean. Um, but yeah, the planetary magic stuff, and also of course Picatrix and and uh, Al Biruni and all the, the that's a, um, and also I think what's interesting about the planetary magic stuff is going back in the day and really thinking about how ancient people thought of the planets as living creatures. This is a completely different vision of the world uh, than I think most people have now. When you imagine that the that the sky is literally filled with with living things, with with 
creatures up there. And I think that the idea that it's filled with these intelligences and these creatures and and uh, and these intelligences are accessible to you through your intelligence and your your intelligence can uh, it can interact with these other intelligences, including like the agent intellect, uh, and you can become one with the agent intellect. Um, this these ideas were the standard accepted model, the the standard model of how the universe worked uh, for many many thousand for a long time, a couple you know at least a thousand years or so, and the, and it's just so interesting that we it's so difficult for most of us to imagine a world like that. That also when we read these texts, they strike us as so weird and um, uh, and uh, and they don't make any sense. And part of what you have to do is basically change how you think about the universe, because we now live in this Copernican dead universe kind of thing or whatever. Um, but when the universe is all of a sudden, everything moving up there is moving because it's alive and because it's intelligent, because only intelligent things can move themselves, uh, according to old Aristotle. That is such a fascinating, different worldview. Um, you know, I just love the, all the agent intellect stuff. I, I find that those four or five lines in Aristotle that where Aristotle discusses the agent intellect of the agent intellect and how it works and how it somehow is in part of us and not part of us. And it's the active part that gives rise. It activates our consciousness and how all that gets sort of in a very tortured way developed all the way through the history of, uh, of philosophy all the way up until I think really Hegel and people um, uh, that is just fascinating. And it's just a part of philosophy that never gets taught in an academic setting. It's just shocking that you can get a PhD in philosophy. I literally got a PhD in philosophy, and every time I wanted to bring up the the role of the active intellect in the history and development of of, of, of philosophy, this got shot down. No one wanted to talk about it. No one really even knew what it was. But it dominates the thought, and really underwrites the thought of so many thinkers in the Middle Ages. Uh, but if you would ask someone now to even teach a class about it, I think you would be hard pressed to even get someone to run a seminar on the concept of the agent intellect, which is such a cool uh, and such an interesting, uh, such an interesting topic. All right. Um, let's see. So I'm not a Marxist. I might be. I'm a believer in esoteric Marxism. Um, if, if Dan Hitler can have an esoteric philosophy, uh, if esoteric Hitlerism can be a thing, then um, you, you should be able to be an, era, an you should be a uh, you should be able to be an esoteric Trotskyist or something. I don't know. Um, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I'm an esoteric Marxist. Um, let's see. Yeah, yeah, you're you're right. You can't explain universal motion without. Uh, or, I mean, the active intellect is basically the thing making the whole thing work. Yossi, do I follow halacha? Uh, I, I I follow halacha kinda. No, no, I'm not bound to it. I don't feel bound to it, but I, I do feel like I I want one. I'd like to lead a more halakhic life. Actually, that'd be a thing I'd love to do, but that would be dependent on me living in a neighborhood that had the infrastructure for that. But um, but yeah, I would like to live a more halakh a more halakhic life. Uh, I used to be really from back in the day, like you know, uh, since this and the whole thing. Uh, and I said I've got less from and more from and I go back and forth. And it, it all depends on what community I'm living in. If I'm living with a bunch of from people, I, I tend to be from. And if I tend to be not, then I tend to not be. So my halacha is very dependent on community, which is probably true for lots of people. Um, uh, Tr Trotsky was a bit of a bastard. Yeah, that's definitely true. He was a bit of a bastard. Uh, uh, yep, that's definitely true. He was, uh, he was, uh, yeah, he was a. Uh, I don't know. I especially dislike some of his stuff on the Spanish Revolution because I'm really like, you know, some people sometimes people ask me what my political beliefs are. And I would say something like I basically you can you can kind of like analyze people based on their who they would support in the Spanish Civil War. And I'm I'm very sympathetic to the poom. In fact, I think I, I have a poom flag hung up right over there. Uh, so I'm very sympathetic. I would would have been very sympathetic to the poom. And I think the way he treated them was not that great, but whatever. Whatever. Do I know anything about the Nazis messing around with the cult? Yeah, they did. The Nazis had all kinds of uh, of neat occult stuff they did. Uh, uh, they, on the one hand, they banned all the you know all the lodges, but then they started doing their own their we own the own their own weird occult stuff. Um, uh, there's really great books about it uh, about sort of the rise of Nazi occultism and stuff like that. But yeah, I, you know, and then the afterlife of all that with with esoteric Hitlerism and, and all this sort of stuff. But yeah, 
Um, you know, fascism has, because fascism is so tied up with mythology, right? The sort of the mythology that underwrites a great deal of fascism, and it's wrapped up with a lot of, uh, with a lot of um, uh, anti anti intellectualism. That there's a kind of there's a kind of easy input to a kind of mysticism that arises uh, that arises uh, in in fascism and specifically in, in Hitlerism, and I find that that's uh, that that's especially true in of the Nazi period. I don't think that's in, that's necessarily true of the far right. There's some weird belief that the far right has the unique grasp that has the unique uh, business with uh, with the uh, with esotericism. I don't think that's true. I mean Levi Elphus Levi Levy was was a was a was a left winger. Um, so was uh, uh, what's his name? The other guy that was uh, um, another left wing uh, esotericist back in the day. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, yeah. There's a hard there's it's, there's no mon monopoly I think on esotericism on the right and the left. I think both can both have access to it in some ways. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, him, you know, Himmler was all about that stuff with the skulls at, at the castle and all that. Uh, Himmler was knee deep in all that stuff. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, definitely the Nazis were up to at least some Nazis in the SS were interested in, in developing a new kind of Nazi religiosity. Um, so that was certainly a thing that existed. Um, no, but yeah, you know, you have the Th the Thule Society and uh, von Armen. That's his name, right? Von Armin, the guy that was the rune guy that did some of the some of the early esoteric stuff as well. Um, um, so yeah, it's yeah, absolutely. There was definitely uh, um, definitely some of that stuff going on there among the Nazis. Um, let's see. Professor Mike, buy me a cup of coffee and ask me about my ways. You believe? Ask me here. Uh, I mean, I, I'm pretty, I tend to be pretty, uh, I tend to be pretty uh, open about what I believe. Although I, I find it weird that you guys would care what I believe. I find, I mean, why, why, why you guys are asking this stuff, we could be talking about cool necromancy manuals, right? Like that seems like so much cooler than what I believe. My beliefs are so uh, of inconsequential. Um, yeah, Cardozo, uh, Cardozo's work is really, really fascinating. Um, there are these, so many of these great uh, Kabbalists that uh, whose work uh, just never really gets like touched on. Uh, I would absolutely love uh, to be able to, you know, I'm trying to do some of this earlier stuff with uh, some of these earlier, um, some of these earlier Kabbalists and stuff like that. Um, I, I, I would, yeah, I would love to, you know, I love to work on that stuff more because these other Kabbalists are so interesting. And I often feel like, and uh, maybe this is my perception and maybe I'm wrong, but that knowledge of Kabbalah uh, among occultists and just general is actually very thin. And part of the reason why that's very thin uh, is that it's just so difficult to get access to this literature because so little of it's translated yet. Um, and so often I find that, uh, that people's knowledge of Kabbalah is very, very thin for this reason. So, um, so yeah, I, 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 I really want to get deeper into unpacking some of these, uh, these more uh, these more obscure Kabbalists. I did an episode on uh, uh, Yochanan Alameno uh, after a really great conversation with the modern hermeticist, uh, and that was great. You know, he just has the Yochanan Alameno is, Alameno is one of these incredibly important Kabbalists. Uh, but if you ask the average person, even people interested in Kabbalah about Alameno, they probably have barely heard anything, uh, very, very, barely anything about them. Um, Osman Spar, uh, thanks. Uh, Don, Don Ragnar, uh, not Ragnar Lothbrook, but Don Ragnar. That's even more interesting if you're Don Ragnar. You're both Italian and uh, like Ragnar Shaggy Bridges. Um, yeah, I I, um, I I like Spar. I've read some Spar, and um, as a calligrapher, I really like the idea of this sort of creating cycles uh, ad hoc. And so I really find his, uh, I, and also his comment, like him and him in conversation with like the rise of letterism, uh, so, so like surrealism and 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 the the relation of signs and signifiers and semiotics and letterism and things like that. I find that stuff super fascinating, and uh, I definitely am going to be doing an episode on Osman Spar when I get there at some point. Uh, but yeah, I find him to be incredibly fascinating. Uh, in fact, I find him to be a lot more fascinating in many ways than than people like um, that. Even people like Crowley, um, I think Crowley was 
much more interesting in some ways, but I find Spar to be a, a singular kind of genius. So I really am interested uh, in, in, in people like, and I really am interested in, in people like Spar. Um, let me jump back up and see some other questions here. And today, folks, I'm only going to be on, be able to be on to, for about an hour and 15, I think. Um, uh, yeah, I'm only going to be on for about an hour and 15. So, uh, so just know that about, at about 5.15 or so, I'll have to go because I got to get ready for Shabbat and all the things, hang out with my ch my kiddos. What do I think of the Curse of Oak Island? Man, I, I what I think about the Curse of Oak Island is this. I wish I had millions of dollars to basically play on an island looking for treasure that ain't there. Um, that would be so much fun, man. Like I used to, when I was a kid, I used to love digging holes in the ground trying to find treasure. If I could do that uh, and just throw, speaking of the accursed chair, right? Just burning a bunch of money. Uh, I am fairly confident there is no treasure on Oak Island. Um, but could it be that the Templars teamed up with the Kabbalist, forged gold out of alien spaceships, and hid it on Oak Island? Um, that guy. Uh, I don't think there's anything on that island. I don't think there's anything on that island. I think that uh, that if there were anything on that island, they'd have found it by now. I mean, the, the people. The one thing they never talk about on that show is in the 1970s, they literally bulldozed that whole island and just dug a giant pit where the alleged money pit was, and they found absolutely nothing. Uh, so I don't think there's anything there, but man, uh, apparently Marty Lagina and they own a winery up North in Michigan. And I always wanted to go to the winery, um, uh, and just hang out with them. I, I just, again, I wish I had that kind of money just to like have to, to do stuff like that. It'd be fun. It'd be a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I remember watching the in search of episode as a kid on Oak Island and man, it just like fired my imagination, totally fired my imagination. And I love that stuff. Um, why is demonology and mastery of a demon so infused with magic and the magus? Uh, because demons give you stuff, right? The uh, demon again. I think that the that I think that the way the medieval people thought about demons is that demons basically have access to all kinds of power, and because they because the the demons have all this kind of power and knowledge and things like this, um, and because the the, the magus that is actually controlling them, right, the magister, the necromancer, or whatever that's controlling them. Because they have a unique position of access to Christ and Christianity, they have the ability to base, basically manipulate these entities into getting what they want, and 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 they can and they can do it and they should do it from their mind because these are evil creatures anyway. So why you know why care? They're, and some of the you know it's it's even worse in some ways than yoking an animal to make them ca carry you around. Well, basically, you, you yoke an animal to carry you around in the Middle Ages because you don't really care that much about animals. Thomas certain Thomas Aquinas certainly didn't. Well, demons are worse than animals in some ways in the in the hierarchy of things. And so if you can harangue a demon into getting you buried treasure, then all the better because you would give some of the money to you know the church or whatever and keep some for yourself. So it comes from a worldview where these demons, because they're fallen angels, they have all, they have all this knowledge and all this power. But because you have a spiritual trump card, so to speak, via the church and religious power, you can basically extract whatever you want from them. Now, that comes at certain kinds of perils that if you do it wrong, they can kill you and things like that because the soul is for God, but the body is for, for the devil. And so if these creatures get access to you, they can hurt you, diddle you. They can do all the bad stuff to you. But that's basically the idea. That's what's motivating a lot of this thinking in the in the in these necromantic manuals is that these beings are basically an untapped resource that could be used for your own ends. And so why not, why not do it? Um, uh, so why not do it? Why not do it? Um, yeah. Thank you for the donation. What's next for esoterica? Um, I can tell you this. Uh, the first thing that's next for esoterica is that I actually have time to work on the channel more this summer. Uh, I actually have time to, uh, to, to, to work on the channel that I, I, you know, barely this uh, been a semester I'm teaching four classes. And so esoterica is just something I get to do basically between the hours of like 5 a.m. and 8 a.m. or whatever when my kids wake up. And so now that I actually have uh, some more time, I'm really looking forward to trying to deepen the channel, uh, maybe do some more interviews, maybe try to put out a little bit more content, maybe a, a, a an extra episode every other week or something like that. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I think the next big thing is, is that, and I think eventually also just getting out in the world and trying to maybe do some traveling and connect with folks in other places, uh, and try to maybe do some in-person stuff. I'd love to do some like weekend seminars. 
uh, that are sort of like really, really intense learning on a specific subject, right? So we would deep dive into, uh, I don't know, Valentinian Gnosticism, right? So there'd just be like a long weekend of studying uh, Valentinian Gnosticism or a long study weekend of, of John D stuff or, or of uh, whatever, and really try to maybe get folks together and do sort of seminar level classes um, over the course of weekends um, in person. I really would love to do some stuff like that, do in-person learning. I really like doing in-person learning. I find that uh, learning with people is far better than you know than 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 just doing it on your own. So um, so I'd love to do that. That would be that would be awesome if I could do that. But again, that'll all it'll all depend on uh, it'll all depend on coronavirus and you know just everything. It's going to depend on a lot of stuff. But definitely want to uh, do that. Definitely want to do this kind of stuff. Um, Julian, that Jewish people were aliens that lived on the planet Lemuria. I don't think so. Nah, um, I don't think so. Have ever heard of Rabbi Ariel Bar Tzadok? Uh, yeah, yeah, I have. Actually, he he and I have uh, communicated via email a couple times. Um, and uh, yeah, he he and I've communicated via email a couple times. But he seems like a nice guy. I don't I haven't followed him at length, so I I don't um, I don't know that much about him. Um, 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 yeah, so I, I can't can't speak to himself, but he seems like he makes great videos, especially on on uh, Abalafia and Abalafia and Kabbalah. Um, let's see. Scroll back up and get some more of these questions. Jewish tradition of magic being one of the possible reasons for the rise of anti-Semitism in Europe. It's an interesting question, though. I, I, to my knowledge, there's always a weird thing about. Uh, but so there's, there's definitely an idea that, that Jewish people have access to weird supernatural knowledge. And that's certainly an idea you see in Christian literature, but I'm trying to think of an example in an anti-Semitic text in the middle ages where Jews practicing magic is part of the anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. And, um, I don't, I can't think of one, right. When I think of, uh, I don't know, a classic one, right. Uh, Martin Luther's on the Jews in their lives, um, of all the things that he blames the Jews for, right. It's never magic. It's never that they're doing magic. You don't. I don't see that kind of stuff. But, um, but yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't think. I don't think of. Uh, I don't think of. Uh, I don't think that's part of it. I don't think that's part of it. Um, yeah, Marco, absolutely. Yeah, uh, a cult black metal episode. Yeah, that's definitely gonna happen at some point soon as well. Um, I'd love to do that too. That'd be so great to do an episode on um, on the intersection of black metal and, and the occult. Um, um, that'd be great. Um, allow me to meld my meld my my interests and in these two things together. Although I will say that I've actually not been listening so much black metal the past several weeks. I've been listening to a lot of like like dark synth music, which sounds like everything great from the eighties. Um, um, I've been one of the bands I've been listening to over and over and over again is this Icelandic band, um, uh, uh, Kaelin Mikla. Uh, I don't know if folks have heard of this band before. Kaelin Mikla. It's a three part band. It's all women. Um, and it is just fantastic, um, sort of dark synth music. It's great. So, but yeah, I definitely want to do something on, um, definitely want to do something on, um, on, um, uh, on occultism and, and black metal. Uh, let's interview some of these people, um, like Hunter Hunt Hendricks, who I think is a really, really smart, um, person on esotericism and the intersection of esotericism and music. Um, and so these folks, that would be that would be cool to hang out with some of those folks. Let's see here. Let me scroll back up and see other questions before we got about ten minutes left. Does the Testament of Solomon have any legitimacy in Judaism? Not really. Not really. No. Uh, it, it's in the Haredi world. I don't think it's known at all anymore. I don't think it's known at all. And in, I think in the in the normative in the sort of liberal Jewish world, I think it's now, no, I think it's, and I think that also, I mean, the Testament of Solomon is a Christian text, basically. It probably has its origins in some Jewish literature, but basically by the time that it enters into the, the, the version we have is basically Christian. So no, I don't think that it, it doesn't really get much, uh, doesn't get any play in the Jewish world. Yeah. Soviet wave is also good. I like that stuff. I like that stuff as well. Um, yeah, synthwave is great. I mean, uh, especially like sort of this darker synthwave stuff. I've been listening to this uh, 
uh, this uh, loop on repeat um, called, uh, I mean, uh, it's great. I'll put it in the chat. Oops. Uh, that's just sort of like a, a collection of all this stuff. Uh, it's just sort of dark sense stuff. It's great. If folks want to, some interesting new music to listen to, I feel like The Cure and, uh, and Joy Division and things like that, uh, this music's great. And I love listening to music. I think there's this idea that you get a certain age and you quit listening to new music, but I don't know. I don't buy that. I do not buy that. Um, if yeah, if World Alchemy Day became a thing, would I ever consider organizing it? But yeah, absolutely. I would love to do a. a one of my favorite things I would love to do is uh, is to actually. Um, one thing I would love to see done at some point. Someone needs to do it, and it's gonna have to be. It's gonna have to be a collaborative effort. But one of the things that I would absolutely love to uh, to to see done is someone to build an al an, an actual alchemical functioning alchemical lab that uh, that is part of a science museum maybe, and um, that this al functioning alchemical lab does alchemy. Like actually, there is a person there who, with some degree, you know, obviously we need fume hoods and things like that, but um, but this person would basically be there to 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 do alchemical demonstrations. And to show people how alchemy, how alchemy was done, why it worked, how it worked, what these people were up to, why they were doing what they were doing, uh, and then to show have you know four or five different alchemical experiments that they do as part of a you know as a part of a you know living living history kind of thing, and then show how these alchemical experiments change over time and how these alchemists actually you know worked because this is the stuff we have this data right we absolutely have this data and. Um, and having a functioning alchemical lab as a as a place where a person where people can learn about how it worked, this seems like a no brainer to me. Like there seems like again like this seems like a no brainer, and I'd love to be part of a of a team of people basically building a, a functioning alchemical lab, reproducing alchemical experiments safely as possible, but as close as possible to the conditions they are being done in the in the Middle Ages. And I think that this is completely conceivable. I think it's completely conceivable. And there are folks out there who are smart and know how to do it. So I would absolutely love, um, love, love to do that. That would be my thing. That would be what I would love to see done is actually World Alchemy Day actually have uh, doing some actual alchemy. Uh, because I think it, it, it can, I think it can be done. I think it absolutely can be done. Uh, do I make an episode on the clip on the cliff? You mean the clipote? Yeah, I'm actually going to be doing an episode maybe probably not next week, but maybe next week, uh, I'm going to be doing an entire episode on the entire origin of this idea of the clipote, uh, the, uh, what is called the, the, the text of called the, the, the treaties on the emanation of the left-hand side, which is basically where this whole idea of the, uh, the clipote comes from. And so, um, I'll be, I'll be doing an episode either next week or pretty soon on the treaties, uh, the, the treaties on the emanation of the left-hand side, just so that folks, just so we can begin having a conversation about what the clipote are, uh, but the concept of clipote at least, right? Uh, that comes in Lurianic Kabbalah much later on. But the idea that the that the Sephirotic system has a kind of other side to it is an idea that goes back uh, even before the Zohar. Even before the Zohar, this idea is already um, um, is already present. It's already present. Um, let's see. I don't know why people are so interested in the clipote. I guess it's, everybody loves evil stuff. Every time I do an episode about demons and things like that, everybody like people love demons and stuff. I uh, it's always I guess it's the same reason why people like to look at car accidents. I don't know. Um, this dreadful things attract people. Uh, so the demons and clipote and necromancy and stuff like that. No one's interested really in you know uh, sh shiny happy people holding hands. Um, but. Um, Scroll down. Yeah, Boy Harsher is great, Ben Brown. Boy Harsher is great. It's a great example of um, one of these sort of dark synth bands. All right. Let's see here. All right. Sorry, folks. I'm just sort of reading so as I'm going. So and I'm just about to be done for the day. Like I said, I'm going to sign off at about hour and about an hour fifteen, so in about six minutes. So, other if you have any last questions, feel free to kind of get them in. How do I separate my academic research into various fields with personal belief? 
it's pretty easy for me. I, 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 maybe other people have a more difficult time with this, um, that, um, and maybe it's also has to do with the fact that people feel like they'll be judged. Their academic work will be judged based on their beliefs. And I, I worry about that too. When I tell people that I, that I work in esotericism philosophy, people think that I'm crazy. They think that I'm basically, you know, that I work in nonsense. Um, but when I tell, when I tell my esoteric folks where I, that when I do esoteric work, when I, when I say basically that I'm a, a, a materialist of a certain kind, um, they also, I think people like take are taken aback and they're like, Oh, can I trust your esoteric work? Uh, given that you, you don't believe in this. And I'm like, well, you should, you should believe what you believe. Um, you should, you should vet what I say based on the sources and based on the evidence, not based on what I believe, who cares what I believe. Um, and so, um, so yeah, it's pretty easy for me to separate them off. Um, I don't have much of a problem asking questions about, uh, about how things work and or why I believe what I believe. And, and, um, and I try to present the information as neutrally as I can, whatever neutral is. Um, but I'm sure I, I have my own biases and my own interests and that's true of everybody. Why does existence exist? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think anyone knows. Uh, uh, I do like that in the Talmud, uh, the rabbis have an argument about whether or not it would have been better for, for human beings not to have existed. Uh, and this argument goes back and forth. And to many people's surprise, the rabbinical position is that it would have been better had they not existed, that, that human beings had not existed. And I always found that to be exactly what I believe. <laughs> I'm like, yep, I agree with the rabbis. I, am, I definitely think it would have been better had we not existed. Um, uh, kind of on the, I'm, I'm kind of on team... Uh, I'm kind of on team Benatar. Uh, if you know David Benatar, the famous uh, pessimist, I'm kind of on team Benatar and uh, I have a, have a streak for, uh, for metaphysical pessimism, like Schopenhauer. I, like in my heart of hearts, I like, there's a part of me that thinks like he must be right. Um, so, um, so yeah. Uh, so I have a, I have a deep, uh, I have a, I have a, I have a uh, spiritual affinity for, for, uh, for Schopenhauer and, uh, for people like David Benatar. Uh, but why it exists, I don't know. It's probably some joke. I, I, tip, I sometimes think that if any religion probably, you know, it, it has to be some kind of cosmic joke. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the history of the Ouroboros. Yeah, Jenny, that's a great uh, great uh, idea too. Because um, we see it, right, early on, right? We find we find images of the Ouroboros in the... Uh, in the uh, in the uh, Greek magical papyri, we see them in the the text of the gold making text of uh, of uh, Chrysopoeia of Cleopatra. So yeah, it's this text is this image is really really early on. So yeah, it'd be great. I don't really know the history of the Ouroboros, but I know it's it's there really early on. And so I'd absolutely love to to dig deep and do an episode about the Ouroboros. That's a great idea. Um. Yeah, the coffin texts. Yeah, that'll be another thing I'll do eventually. Is an episode on the call, a coffin text. Um, um, some of the earliest magical spells we have. In fact, the coffin texts. Uh, well, the the pyramid texts are the earliest, right? The coffin texts are a later version of the same kind of thing. Uh, they kind of get more democratized. Uh, but yeah, the coffin texts and the pyramid texts are super interesting. And again, some of the the, the pyramid texts are the old the old the oldest continuously composed magical document in the world. Um, so the pier the pyramid texts are, if you want the oldest magical text that we have, basically, uh, the, the pyramid texts are, are them and the pyramid texts of Unas, uh, are the oldest, they're the first ones. And I've been in that burial chamber myself. And I tell you, it is breathtaking to be in that, to be in that burial chamber. It really is absolutely breathtaking to be down there in Saqqara in that, in the, in the burial chamber of Unas, assuming we pronounce his name that way, who knows? Um, Oh, great. The Bardic Owl. You're going to have a, cler a clerical necromantic underground in your D&D campaign. Absolutely. Uh, I, I really, one of my hopes for the channel, right, my joke, right, is that if the channel produces enough good band names, then I've done my job. But also, if people playing Dungeons and & Dragons and other role-playing games can get information from these, the, the from Esoterica to go into their their uh, Dungeons & Dragons campaigns, then all the better. Um, you guys would probably laugh that, you know, when I have uh, my computer, my laptop set up here to do the live streams, to get the to get the laptop high enough so it's level to my face or whatever, I just have like the player's handbook, Volo's Guide to Monsters, uh, Baldur's Gate: Descent into Avernus, uh, Morning Canaan's Tomb of Foes, uh, the DM's Guide, other stuff. 
So yeah, I have basically have my all my uh, I have my uh, AD and D monster manual. Like basically, what's make what's supporting the computer right now is a bunch of D and D books. So uh, yeah, I am all about um, uh, all about the the D and D life. I'm mapping a whole shelf of my D and D stuff over there. So all right, so let me get any other last questions before I jump off because I'm going to jump off in just a minute to go get ready for Shabbos and hang out with the kids and. Do stuff. Oh yeah, five E is great. I love five E. Uh, people people get a lot of uh, a lot of people don't like five E for some reason, but I love five E and I grew up on AD and D, so I love it. I think it's great. I think it's really well done. Way better than fourth edition. Not I did not fourth edition felt like a crappy video game. Crappy video game. Uh, would I ever feel consider doing a, 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 a one shot D and D campaign, a colleague? Yeah, I would love to do a D and D episode. That would be great. That would be great. That would be great. There is no fourth edition. Yeah, I, I, I don't like fourth edition. Uh, I like three point five better than four. But all right, folks. Um, I think I'm gonna probably, uh, uh, I'm probably going to. Uh, do I think that the elite use human sacrifices? Yes, it's called war. Uh, yes, the elite, uh, the elites use human sacrifices by things like uh, forcing people into poverty and making them uh, basically die from diabetes because uh, uh, medicine is so expensive and then shoving them into wars that never end, um, right? Um, to make them fight for oil or whatever, lithium or whatever thing that the, the elite want. So yeah, I don't think they're sacrificing kids for that kind of stuff, but I think they're sacrificing working class people all day, every day. And they have been doing it for a while. So yeah, I think that uh, Satanism has nothing on uh, on the war machine, and that, folks, is from from Black Sabbath. So, speaking of Sabbath, right? I'll end on end on uh, end on some Black Sabbath, right? Um, Ozzy, pray for a sacred Ozzy, pray for us. Um, so, end on end on that. All right, folks. Well, uh, I will be doing uh, live streams all summer. Uh, we'll be doing live streams uh, every other week, as I think was what I've settled on. So every other week, we'll be doing live streams uh, on you know on just general Q and A, taking questions, talking about the episodes, hanging out, uh, you know, uh, all this kind of stuff. So uh, again, I just want to thank all of you guys for taking the time to hang out with me today and for, for supporting the channel, uh, especially folks who are Patreon supporters. Uh, I'm absolutely just, I'm really indebted and thank you so much for supporting the channel. If you uh, want to support the channel uh, by becoming a patron, I would absolutely uh, love that. Uh, or with a one-time donation, just to support the channel. Um, again, this channel is basically a, a, a work of a passion of love. Uh, it's a work of passion. And I, and um, you know, the only works because basically I have, um, I have supported people willing to lend five bucks or 10 bucks a month to make it work. So if folks want to help out with Patreon, or with uh, donations to the channel, it all goes to making all this possible. So I super appreciate it, and I really want to really thank you. And again, thanks for everybody. Right, uh, I make this information accessible to anyone who has a, a you know anyone who access YouTube. And so um, yeah, it's great to great to hang out with all of y'all, uh, talk with y'all, answer some questions, hang out. Um, yeah, thank you all uh, for folks who are celebrating Logba Omer. I hope you have a good couple of last hours, Logba Omer. Um, and, uh, for folks who are, uh, who observe the, the, the Sabbath, I hope that you have a great Shabbat, uh, restful Shabbat, uh, for folks who, uh, who observe the Sabbath in other ways or observe their own Sabbaths, whatever that is. I hope you find a way to, uh, take care of yourself, treat yourself, uh, kindly because you deserve that. We all deserve to be treated kindly and deserve absolutely to treat yourself kindly. And, um, I'll see folks in a couple of weeks and uh, be looking for the next episode of Esoterica next week. So again, much peace, much thanks. Um, yep. Thank you guys. I will see all of you at some point in the future.